Hello, and welcome to the Three Links Oddcast, your podcast for all things having to do with Odd Fellowship. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Three Links Oddcast. I'm one of your hosts, Toby Hansen. I'm Ainsley Heilig, and we are here once again with our guest host, Christopher McHale. Hello, how's it going? Because everything is going great here so far today. Ah, wonderful, brother. <laughs> great to have you with us on the Oddcast again. Uh, for our listeners wondering where Sergio is for this episode, uh, he's on special assignment. Uh, he's working with our research division here at the Three Links Oddcast. And actually, uh, we've got quite a bit of material from our research division here. We're going to be presenting in this episode. But before we do that, we want to thank our wonderful, magnanimous, and great-smelling sponsor, Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff. They provide wonderful service. They make these excellent soaps and other bath products. It's absolutely fantastic. Treat yourself to the luxury of clean skin with Pig and a Pug Bath Products. So, brothers, we've just had uh, kind of a little election here in the United States. Uh, I don't know. Did you guys notice anything about that? I must have missed it. I took a couple weeks off to do some stuff. Uh, so I missed a few episodes. And I've just, I, I, I'm kind of, I might need to get caught up on that. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed because I needed to get a new mailbox uh, because it would seem that the hinge from my old one got so worn from them putting all these flyers in my mailbox. Now, this is the second time in a row I've brought that up, so that's how I noticed the election. Interesting. Wow. Well, apparently, um, we elected a president, or maybe not. I'm really not sure at this point. Uh, it may be a little too early to tell, uh, but it got us here at the Three Links Oddcast thinking uh, about the glorious and impressive list of famous and powerful odd fellows uh, that we all draw strength and inspiration from. Because uh, one thing that we are known for in the Independent Order of Odd Fellows is careful guardianship of our most important history. So we decided to put together this episode and talk about some of the great leaders who have also been odd fellows. Uh, I'm going to start this one out. Uh, usually we go through the list of presidents and vice presidents who are odd fellows. I'm going to switch it up a little bit here and start with a Canadian prime minister who is an odd fellow. And that would be uh, the father of Canadian Confederation himself, Sir John A. MacDonald. Brother MacDonald belonged to Catariqui Lodge Number 10 of Kingston, Ontario. And I apologize if I, I mispronounce that. I'm sure Brother Wayne will email me and let me know uh, the correct pronunciation if I mess that up. Uh, Brother MacDonald was the dominant force behind Confederation and brought the Dominion of Canada into existence July 1st, 1867. Prior to that, uh, Canada had been a, a group of sort of somewhat independent crown colonies in North America. There was Canada East, Canada West, which we would modern day equate those to Quebec and Ontario. Uh, there were the various maritime provinces like Prince Edward Island. Uh, and then there was this uh, group out on the west coast of Canada that was getting organized. There was Vancouver Island and then the colony of British Columbia. And uh, John A. MacDonald, he said, hey, guys, let's all get together and run our own country here. We're right next to the United States. They seem like they want to get just bigger and bigger. In fact, if you're familiar with the slogan 5440 or fight, that was a rallying cry in the United States at that time when we just wanted to annex almost everything up to the Arctic Circle, basically. We just said, you know what? We'll make all of that American. It will be excellent. Wouldn't Calgary be a great city in the U.S.? So uh, John A. MacDonald comes along. He says, no, Canada, let's all get together and be Canadians. And one of the biggest things that he did, aside from actually stitching the country together, he was the, the real driving force behind the Canadian Pacific Railway. One of the reasons that British Columbia said, yeah, we'll duck in with the rest of you and become part of the Dominion of Canada is because they were promised a railway. So they joined in 1871 and they sat around patiently going, yeah, any minute now, 
just get that railway built across the prairies and over the Rocky Mountains and in here to British Columbia. Well, in the end, John A. Macdonald did get that done. He got the Canadian Pacific built uh, with a lot of government financing and a considerable amount of political opposition. Uh, but once they were able to move troops quickly around Canada to put down things like the Northwest Rebellion, uh, everybody said, you know, maybe having our own railroad is a good idea. Now, he's considered to be the father of Canada, but he is not without uh, a few negative marks in his history. For example, the Northwest Rebellion, uh, the Métis people of what is now Manitoba looked around and said, I don't know if we're so hot on this whole idea of becoming part of Anglophone Canada. And uh, of course, in Ontario, they were like, you're going to be part of Canada and you're going to speak English and do things our way. The Métis people weren't crazy about that. They rebelled against it. And the leader of that rebellion, a man named Louis Riel, uh, was hanged to death. And that made a lot of enemies in French-speaking Canada. Another thing that John A. Macdonald did that was not terribly popular was the Chinese head tax, which was an attempt in the 1880s to keep Chinese emigration into Canada very, very low because he was concerned about disturbing the quote-unquote Aryan sensibilities of Canada. Along with that, he did a lot of uh, things that were common at the time, uh, but very, very insensitive and inhumane to Canada's indigenous population. So as has been the case in a lot of places, statues of John A. Macdonald have gone up, but some statues like the one in Victoria, for example, uh, that statue was taken down. So that's a little bit about uh, Brother John A. Macdonald, uh, Canada's first prime minister. Fantastic. and. Is he our only non-United States person we're discussing tonight? Yeah, he's, he's the only non-American in the group. You know, there, there have been other interesting world leaders. Winston Churchill, for example, he was an odd fellow. Um, one of the kings of Norway and one of Sweden, I don't remember which ones. They were odd fellows. And, you know, there have been some various people and a few Supreme Court justices and some senators and congressmen. But given that the uh, national election is so prominent recently, we kind of wanted to keep it with more national figures. And since we do have 19 Canadian listeners to the podcast, uh, mm -hmm. I figured we should include Sir John A. So I'm going to segue that into a little um, self-promotional shout out. So for listeners who need a visual guide to follow along with this episode for your visual enjoyment... Um, if you just Google famous American odd fellows, probably the first thing that'll come up is a digital painting that I was commissioned to do a number of years ago that has, I think, probably everybody pretty much that we're discussing this evening other than our Canadian brother that we just mentioned. So if anybody wants to open up their Googler and type in famous American odd fellows, boom, there's your picture. So you can follow right along with us. Excellent. And uh, um, having seen that painting, I think it's excellent. You did a great job on that one. Thank you. You know, I have never seen a picture of Albert Pike where he looks more distinguished. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to do everybody a service to make them look their best. So moving on to uh, U.S. presidents, uh, who's our first odd fellow president? That would be Ulysses S. Grant. So, segueing from my digital painting, so Ulysses S. Grant uh, was born in 1822, and he was our Reconstruction president after the Civil War. He is pretty much known as a curmudgeon who didn't really want to do much of nothing and was kind of arm-twisted into every single thing he did in life. He mostly kind of wanted to just ride his horse and be left alone. He went to West Point. He didn't enjoy it, but he went and graduated and did very well, even though he hated it. He was a very successful leader in the Mexican-American War, hated it. And um, after that uh, conflict wrapped up, he joined the Odd Fellows in 1851 or 1852-ish. Um, that was right around the time he decided to take a seven-year uh, military hiatus 
and decided to just kind of try to make it as a civilian, which he failed tremendously at. He, I guess, was a member of the Point Pleasant 33 of Ohio. And I found that he had, during this uh, military hiatus, lived in Galena, Illinois. I do not know if he was active in uh, Will D. Number 5, which that lodge is still active today. If anybody uh, in Northern Illinois listening, if anybody knows if Ulysses S. Grant was active in that lodge, uh, let us know. That'd be cool to find out. He didn't seem to be super active in the order as far as my research could find. I couldn't really find a lot. One of the few things I did find, however, for Grant was he was uh, the deciding factor in Arkansas's Brooks-Baxter affair of 1874. Scott Moy of Little Rock had filled me in on this incident, and I would love to try to kind of sum it up for the listeners. This Brooks-Baxter affair was a... uh, gubernatorial race that was disputed heavily that it seemed about as easy to explain as what's happening right now so just google it it's on wikipedia it's confusing as mud what happened was there was a fight people were dying there was a stabbing uh somebody hid out in the odd fellows lodge in little rock down from the old state house and the incumbent governor was trying to stay governor and there was somebody trying to oust him who was disputing the results and madness ensued and reluctantly president grant was uh called to decide the race and not a hundred percent proved but scott's research and this would be a great whole episode on its own because there's lots of odd fellow kind of stuff involved with it Grant went with the odd fellow, which was the incumbent governor. So the governor who wanted to stay in power managed to stay in power. But it's a huge, confusing battle. It was a huge, confusing time for Arkansas. The KKK was involved. It was right after the war. Reconstruction was going on. There was just all sorts of crazy things going on. And uh, yes, Look up either the Brooks-Baxter Affair, the Brooks-Baxter War. It's Arkansas Civil War is what it's kind of referred to as. Very interesting and kind of by virtue of being an odd fellow, the incumbent governor was able to hold his seat. So that was about all I was really about to find on Grant and Odd Fellows. However, I was able to find considerably more about Grant's first vice president, Skylar Colfax, who was a very active member for a good bit in the Odd Fellows. Well, that's great because, um, you know, anyone who's been around Odd Fellowship for more than a year or two has noticed that we have a strange fascination and love for Skylar Colfax. But most Odd Fellows are not aware of who he was as a politician. And most political scientists are not aware of who he was or what he did as an odd fellow. So this is a good opportunity uh, for a little bit of uh, information crossing. We can learn uh, more about why he was such a prominent and important figure in American history at that time. Colfax is a little interesting to me because uh, where I live, I'm kind of pretty close to Indiana, and that was where he, his main stomping grounds were for a while there. And they kind of, Indiana kind of claims him. So, yeah, just by virtue of kind of being stones throw away this was kind of a good one for me to take on so the quick rundown the quick bio for colfax he was born in 1823 uh moved to indiana in 1836 he became a reporter that's how he got to start his career in 1846 in south bend indiana and apparently there's a lovely monument to colfax in south bend as well as in indianapolis so he joined as a reporter, he joined the lodge South Bend 29 at age of 21, which at that time you had to be 21 to join. And he pretty quickly, he worked his way up to Noble Grand and then on to lodge rep and then eventually to grand rep in uh, 1850. So that's a pretty rapid climb to go from a new member to all the way to grand rep in just a matter of like a very small handful of years. And he, at that time, 
his first visit to Sovereign, was put on a committee to prepare a ritual for the ladies. And so he and these other committee members then spent the year compiling and writing and writing. And in 1851, they, the committee report resulted in what was considered one of the fiercest battles in the order's history. Ooh. Ooh. Probably not, you know, not to be seen since, you know, some of our other big things like uh, 2001 admitting women to be full-fledged odd fellow members in uh, situations like that. Anytime there's a big change, there's going to be a big, uh, big fracas. So um, there was a big, uh, big battle over that. Um, I don't know exactly what went down. I would have to look up a journal of that year to see how it went. But um, it was 46 votes for yay and 37 nays. And so through a very, you know, narrow victory, uh, the beautiful De Rebecca degree was established. And that was a good 15 years before the Order of the Eastern Star. So that is a nice little feather of progressiveness in the Odd Fellows cap. Colfax was very active for that, this window of time and the Odd Fellows. So after he does that, he kind of moves on from Odd Fellowship, it seems, and then quickly transitions into politics because by 1855 he was a congressman and he served in the house of representatives uh from 1855 to 1869 and three terms he spent as speaker of the house mm. so this guy was he was pretty good at um putting his mind to something and getting to it real quick so he was able to move very quickly and be successful because he was very well known for his eloquent and moving speeches. One of the things that he gave credit to was being an odd fellow for giving him the skills necessary to convey his thoughts clearly and concisely in a moving manner. And his first speech was actually um, at an odd fellows lodge. That is literally one of the bonuses of being a member is you learn skills that you can then apply to other areas of your life. We can't promise you're going to, you know, go on and have a great career in politics or anything like that, but you can learn some good skills that you can apply elsewhere in your life. He um, would do these great speeches. It helped him really move out into the world and a little bit beyond odd fellowship into the politics. And then, boom, he lands as vice president uh, for the, the first term of uh, Ulysses S. Grant's presidency. Through his great speechification, he was able to convince the government to go all in with money for railroad projects, which is unfortunately what became his demise. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Not to get into it too deeply because there's, you know, it's a huge thing in and of itself, but the uh, credit mobilier scandal is what it is known as. And that is kind of what kind of took him down out of politics just very quickly. He was never charged with any crimes or any malfeasance, but he kind of took that as his hint to skedaddle. After that, he just kind of went on speaking tours for the rest of his life and made money that way. And uh, he did speeches until he died in 1885. And that is Schuyler Colfax. Very nice. And, one interesting thing about Colfax, at the time that he was vice president, it was when a lot of the Western states, like out here in Washington, were still being settled. So you have a lot of places that would be named Colfax County, where you'd have towns named Schuyler or Colfax. Here in Washington, we actually had uh, a lodge in the town of Colfax, Washington, which was named for Schuyler Colfax. I don't remember the number off the top of my head. Uh, might be 14. That sounds about right. Uh, I think Colfax number 14. Uh, so it was a, a fairly early lodge in the history of the Grand Lodge of Washington. But he was a, a very important political figure. It's also important to keep in mind that at the time, in the 1850s, Odd Fellowship was barely 30 years old here in North America. And so the idea of starting a branch for women so that they could have a degree of self-determination 
and participate in fraternalism was a very radical idea. I mean, this was long before women in this country could vote. That was long before, in some places, women could even own their own property. In many cases, if you owned something when you were married, it transferred to your husband automatically. So it was actually a very radical idea in 1851 to create the Daughters of Rebecca as this auxiliary group where women could do things for themselves. That was a, an incredibly new and progressive idea at the time. However, they did not at the time allow the women to just totally run the show because didn't they not have to have a male member overseeing the lodge meetings at that time? That's correct. Originally, um, when the Rebecca degree was first adopted, it was a side degree for odd fellows and their female relatives. So you had to be a wife or a daughter of a third degree odd fellow. And that meant that there had to be... a at least one third degree odd fell present to open a Rebecca Lodge. As time went on, odd fellowship has more or less progressed along with society and responded to the changes. So as women became more and more socially and financially independent, the Rebecca's went from being a side degree for odd fellows to being a fully functioning women's organization uh, all the way up until they founded uh, individual Rebecca assemblies in jurisdictions and then the International Association of Rebecca Assemblies, which is the, the top sovereign level body for our Rebecca sisters. The fact that we 15 years ahead of the Masons were progressive enough to offer that for the female uh, relatives of Oddfellows, I think is one of those things that, for me, I, I think that's you know really outstanding. And it kind of shows how we were a little bit more progressive and then maybe kind of tightened the belt a little bit as we entered the 20th century. But it's, it's, a, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting footnote of our history. And I think it also helps to illustrate one of the differences because in the popular imagination, Odd Fellows and Masons are exactly the same. But when you look at the, the history and the intent of each organization, you see that while Masonry, in a lot of cases, is very much about perpetuating something that approaches antiquity, Odd Fellowship is about providing for present needs in the world. And that allows us to more easily be flexible and provide for those needs as they change. I think another way that's reflected is when you look at the founding of the Grange, uh, which was founded by prominent Masons and Odd Fellows, uh, like A.B. Grosh, for example, the Grange was co-ed from the beginning. They said, we understand that rural people are going to have families, and so they're going to need something for the whole family to be involved in. And so the Grange started out as a co-ed organization. And, that, you know, that's, I like to think that's partly because of the influence of the Odd Fellows who helped found the Grange. That kind of uh, bringing people together and that tolerance and that perpetuation of progress is, I feel like something that is a cornerstone of Odd Fellowship because they were motivated enough of Odd Tradesmen to come together and make something happen when there was nothing to do for people like that. So um, if it would be okay, I would love to read a selection from the Theodore Ross uh, history of Oddfellows about how Oddfellows does bring people together after the American Civil War. I feel that this is kind of a healing moment in America. And this passage I feel just is linked inextricably to what we're facing right now. So if that is okay with you. Oh, um, absolutely. That's, that's also a good setup for our next segment, which is the 1876 election. Wonderful. Because <laughs> this kind of comes, this comes on the, t you know, with the, the, you know, you know, talking about the reconstruction era and everything. So um, this is also available on the oddfellows.org uh, website, um, IOOF.org or odd-fellows.org. It's, it's but the same website. The American Civil War, 1861 to 1865, shattered the IOOF in America. 
Membership decreased and many lodges were unable to continue their work, especially in the southern states. During these years, the role of the southern jurisdictions was regularly called during the annual sessions of the Sovereign Grand Lodge. So that meant that they, you know, they still included them in spirit, even though they, they were separate but because of war. At the close of the war, the officers and members of the South were welcomed to the chairs and seats which had been held for them during the four years of strife and separation. The roll call at Baltimore, the 18th of September, 1865, by the Venerable Grand Secretary Ridgely was notable even in fraternal circles. Every survivor answered to his name and appointments had been made to fill vacancies so that the representation was complete. Attempts had been made throughout the states composing the Southern Confederacy with varying success to keep up the organizations of the order. But at this reunion, measures were unanimously adopted whereby fraternal hands and hearts assisted in rebuilding the waste places. This was the first fraternization of the blue and the gray. The procession in the streets of Baltimore the next day, occupying more than one hour in passing any given point, attracted national attention. So they had a big old party and a big old parade in Baltimore just like two months after Appomattox Courthouse, where uh, Grant and Lee uh, signed to uh, for the surrender of the Confederacy. So that was a very quick turnaround to have brothers literally be in uniform fighting each other and then to turn around and then shed their uniforms, get to Baltimore and sit together as brothers and not fight about it. And I think that is a huge testament to what this, uh, this organization can do and what it does and what it did and what it can do in the future. I think another good example of that is the dedication of the Thomas Wildey Monument uh, when Brother Jefferson Davis was uh, in federal custody and he was actually invited to the dedication ceremony as an odd fellow and one of the commandants of the prison camp where he was being held was also an odd fellow. The two of them went together as guests and, you know, we're not here to defend anything that Jefferson Davis did, but in that moment, he was not regarded as an enemy of the nation. He was regarded as a brother odd fellow. And I think that really sums up just how powerful the bonds of odd fellowship can be. Moving on together, hand in hand, and making good things happen, because after that moment, is really the birth of American fraternalism really took off after the Civil War. So moments like that are probably those sparks that helped kind of start igniting that fire. And then, of course, industrialization and the Western expansion. And just it was just a perfect storm. Now, now Christopher, you haven't had a, a whole lot of input here in this early part of the show. Uh, what are some of your thoughts about these early Odd Fellow leaders? Uh, I think that they really paved the way and they really set a precedent. One of my super exciting pastimes is uh, reading old Odd Fellows pamphlets and just, you know, anything that I could get my, my hands on. And uh, it seemed like uh, some of those early pioneers in Odd Fellowship really were uh, a, a wealth of information and, uh, really uh kind of willing to put themselves out there it's kind of nice to see you know how odd fellowship does bring different people together you know you'll have ditch di diggers together with politicians and everyone is the same and they're all sitting at the same table one of the things that i have always felt is that when you're an odd fellow everyone has something to offer everybody you know so it, it, it's nice seeing uh, how some of them were actually used in, in beneficial ways within their lodges. It's nice. I bet you none of them were cleaning the toilets, though. <laughs> you know, I can pretty much guarantee that, as that was a little bit early for indoor plumbing in the 1850s, the 1860s. They weren't cleaning the outhouse then. 
No, it well, it was not something you really wanted to clean. You just put some dirt over the top and dug a new one. So I was gonna say you, you actually moved the outhouse. Yeah, that's right. Well, Skylar Colfax wasn't moving the outhouse. I could tell you that. <laughs> Well, that's a good setup for our next area of history, and that is the election of 1876. So a little bit of background on 1876. Uh, President Grant had completed his second term, and he was kind of waffling back and forth on whether or not to run for a third term. Ultimately, he decided against it. The Republicans could not come up with a nominee. They kept voting and voting and voting, and nobody had enough votes 1876 was a very, very politically divisive year for America. You had George Armstrong Custer and the Battle of the Little Bighorn, where he slaughtered uh, all of those Native Americans in that fruitless battle. You had a lot of other controversies going on at the time, and it all led up to an incredibly, incredibly, almost disastrous presidential election in the fall. Ultimately, the Republicans decided to run Rutherford B. Hayes, who was Ohio governor at the time. He had William Wheeler as a running mate. The Democrats uh, picked Samuel Tilden and Thomas Hendricks, who we'll hear more about a little later. And uh, it was right at the end of Reconstruction, which those of you not versed in your American history, after the Civil War, federal troops stayed in the South and basically enforced civil rights for newly freed slaves. In the 1870s, following the Civil War, uh, that was the time after the 14th Amendment, uh, African-American males could vote, and they could hold property, they could buy things, engage in commerce, all of these new rights that had been uh, given to the freed slaves. And the Southerners who had been defeated in the Civil War did not want to do that. Uh, that was the origin of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, because there was a huge amount of resistance to the idea of putting these formerly enslaved people on the same citizenship as their former owners. So Grant had a tough time kind of keeping the country together. He used a lot of very direct intervention by the United States Army and Navy in patrolling the South and ensuring that there was enfranchisement of black voters, uh, that there could be uh, proper public processions, uh, that basically civil rights were respected. The South had become tired of it, and frankly, many in the North had become tired of it. It was expensive to garrison all of these troops in Southern cities just to make sure that some former slaves could go out and vote every now and then. So the country was very unsettled about this, and a lot of people were ready for the end of Reconstruction. This all led to the very contentious election of 1876. What ended up happening, uh, Tilden and Thomas, the Democrats, they won the popular vote. Uh, and this was one of those elections where it wasn't just a plurality, they actually won more than 50% of the vote. In the end, when all the electoral votes were counted, Hayes and Wheeler were declared the president and vice president, respectively. And this was because of a problem in the Electoral College dealing with four states. Oregon, as a Washingtonian, I'm not at all surprised by that. Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. Uh, what happened down south is the reported returns favored Tilden, the Democrat. However, there were a lot of reports of voter fraud and intimidation in those states. For example, in South Carolina, the vote count that was reported indicated that 101% of eligible voters had voted in the election. 101%! Wow! Imagine that. Good going, South Carolina. <laughs> That's a very good showing. Yeah. And <laughs> there were a lot of accusations of electoral fraud. Specifically, since many voters at the time were illiterate, the parties would print up sample ballots. You'd take it into the poll with you and vote according to what the party told you on the sample ballot. Well, this is all fine and good if you can read. 
if you can't read and you rely on symbols to let you know which party is which, then you are very easily victimized. And in fact, that's what happened. Some unscrupulous people printed ballots full of Democratic candidates that had a Republican symbol at the top essentially telling the illiterate voters, hey, to vote Republican, vote for Samuel Tilden and Thomas Hendricks and all these other Democrats. So the uh, South Carolina ballots were reviewed by the State Electoral Commission, which was controlled by Republicans, and they threw out uh, several hundred Democratic ballots and said, oh, look at that. After the ballots have been disqualified, Hayes and Wheeler have won the election in South Carolina. Well, of course, the Democrats challenged that. It got into a legal fight in South Carolina. And uh, ultimately, two groups of electors were sent to Washington. In Florida and Louisiana, they had a similar problem, which was incumbent Republican governors in each state, uh, newly elected Democratic governors in each state, and the governors elect decided they were just going to send their own slate of electors to Washington, D.C. to cast electoral votes instead of the sitting Republican governors. As this played out, there came to be a major problem. In Oregon, the problem was an elector who was chosen. Oregon had three electoral votes, and one of the three had been a postmaster. And under the Constitution, you're not eligible to be an elector if you're a federal employee. So the Democratic governor of Oregon said, oh, I know what we'll do. We'll just disqualify him, and I'll send a Democrat in his place. So Oregon sent a split delegation. Uh, one of the electors said two votes for Hayes, one for Tilden. The other two electors said, no, that should be three votes for Hayes. This led to a constitutional crisis in Washington, D.C. It got so bad between the election in November and the ultimate decision, which came down in March, right before the inauguration, that there were violent riots across the country. Uh, Rutherford Hayes happened to be governor of Ohio at the time, and there were mobs and riots outside of the governor's mansion in Ohio, and even one shot was fired at the governor's mansion. In 1876. Just one? Just, just one little boo. Fortunately, just one. It's probably small caliber. It's, maybe it's a little twenty-two. They were thinking they could just get his attention or something. <laughs> I think it was maybe it was an accident. Like, like they were just shaking it and it just like went off. <laughs> <laughs> Competing crowds came to the state house and said, Hey, we we demand to hear the president elect. Brother Rutherford Hayes, being a very, very wise individual, came out on the balcony and said, It is impossible at so early a time to obtain the result. Now, President Grant had to call in military reinforcements to Washington, D.C. to keep the peace because it was getting so contentious. So in January 1877, Congress, uh, they set up an electoral commission of 15 members, five House, five Senate, five Supreme Court. They started meeting January 31st, reviewing all of the votes from those four contested states. It took them until March 2nd to declare a winner. Now, the inauguration was scheduled for March 4th. At the time, uh, the new president took over in March of the following year after the election. So on March 2nd, they finished their work and said, we have decided that Rutherford Hayes has won the election by a margin of one electoral vote, 185 to 184. Brother Hayes was sworn in as president in a private and closely guarded ceremony at the White House. A small public inauguration under heavy security followed two days later. The ultimate solution of this constitutional crisis from the election of 1876 uh, was this electoral commission. And uh, in 1887, Congress finally passed the Electoral Count Act which clarified the rules for electors and how they could be chosen, how they could be awarded, and how they could be counted. There is a rumor that persists that to get the Democrats to drop their challenges to the election, 
there was a compromise of 1877, which basically said, you let us have the presidency for these four years, Hayes will not run again, and we will end Reconstruction. There is not any historical documentation of that. It could have been a backroom deal that was struck amongst gentlemen at the time, uh, but there's, there's no paper trail. There's no documentation of it. So it's, it's rumored that Hayes agreed to this compromise of ending Reconstruction. Personally, in his personal life, Brother Hayes had always been a major advocate for African-American enfranchisement. He led a legislative effort in Ohio to give the vote to black men before the Civil War. So he was not in any way, shape, or form a Southern sympathizer. Uh, add to that, he also was the commander of the 23rd Ohio Regiment in the Civil War, where future president and odd fellow William McKinley served. It is highly unlikely that Brother Hayes actually agreed to this supposed compromise. But that's the rumor that persists to this day. So the election of 1876 had rather far-reaching consequences in American politics. After that, the South did not vote for Republicans until after the civil rights era, 100 years in the future. It wasn't until after the 1960s that Republicans could get elected in the South. The Democratic Party had what they considered their solid South. And so that's why you had Democrats like Lyndon Johnson, who under any other circumstances might have been considered a Republican by modern standards. But in the South, you were a Democrat or you were nothing. And that's that was the, the Dixiecrats, correct? The Dixiecrats, yes. that's right. The election was actually in the Democratic primary because Republicans did not get elected in the South. So a little bit about the election of 1876 and how it actually involved two odd fellows, Rutherford B. Hayes on one ticket and Thomas Hendricks on the other. President Hayes took office and he was probably the most committed odd fellow of any to serve in federal office. Uh, he was initiated into Crofton Lodge. I hope I'm saying that right. Number 77 in Fremont, Ohio. That was September 15th, 1849. Uh, he was a very committed odd fellow. When he left Fremont, Ohio to pursue his law career in Cincinnati, he actually took an associate membership at a lodge in Cincinnati and was a regular participant there. During his service in the 23rd Ohio Regiment, he commanded future President William McKinley. He also signed McKinley's application to join the Odd Fellows. So a very unique situation of one future president sponsoring another future president into the order. Nice. Uh, McKinley went on to serve with great distinction in the 23rd. And I would also point out that Rutherford Hayes was already in his 40s when he volunteered for the 23rd Ohio Regiment, but he felt so strongly about the cause of preserving the Union and bringing freedom to former slaves that he went out as a middle-aged man and volunteered for military service, ultimately retiring at a very high rank, I believe, uh, maybe Brigadier General, uh, maybe not quite that high, but uh, he was very well thought of as a military commander. He founded the Ohio State University, and uh, he also did a lot of philanthropic work uh, through the Odd Fellows. At the time of his passing, he was on the committee to find the location for the Ohio Odd Fellows Orphans Home. So he did quite a bit. My favorite story about Brother Hayes was at the conclusion of his presidency. Uh, in 1881, he returned home to Fremont, Ohio, to his estate, Spiegel Grove, and went back to Lodge. And he happened to show up at Lodge on the night that they were nominating officers. And of course, the president of the United States walks in the door. All of the brothers there were just dumbfounded with this incredible honor. And they immediately said, Mr. President, you have to serve as Noble Grand. We nominate you for the office of Noble Grand. And he said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done in leadership positions. You know, 
I was a commander in the Civil War. I was president of the United States. Uh, I have done much great work. I'm here to enjoy fellowship. They're like, nope. All in favor of Rutherford Hayes, Noble Grand, vote by the usual sign. Motion carries. Congratulations, you're Noble Grand. And so no. as soon as he finished his presidency, <laughs> he had to go back and serve as Noble Grand of his lodge. You know, he wasn't cleaning the toilets. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, no, that's that's the vice president's <laughs> job, duh. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, of course. I think that's really like, I, I feel like you know most people once they kind of are stepping stone through things and they kind of use the odd fellows as a way to kind of as like a kind of a proving ground to kind of learn that how to do parliamentary procedure, how to run a meeting, all that kind of stuff, and just just move on, you know, and kind of they learned what they could from it and then they go on to their bigger career moves but to come back to it i think that's a really you know a good that's a re really big testament to you know him as an odd fellow yeah and he he actually did a lot of uh, lecturing about odd fellowship and how he felt it was incredibly beneficial for american society following the civil war he frequently went out and in speeches would say, odd fellowship and fraternalism in general is one of the things that helps bring people together at a time when we need that. Yeah, he was literally walking the walk as well as talking the talk. He was leading by example. And that's, you know, it goes back to what I was saying before. Some of these guys use that experience and brought it back to the lodge and I'm I'm sure we're, you know, amazing at getting things done. They certainly had the respect of their their uh, constituents, you know. Plus, he had a very nice beard. Oh, he did. That, as, I mean, that counts for a lot. Yeah. Yeah. As far as presidential beards go, man, he's he's up there. And then for sideburns, you got to give it to Chester Allen Arthur. Yeah, not not Van Buren. Those are. I, you know, Van Buren's his were a mess. Frankly, I mean. <laughs> I don't want to speak ill of an American president uh, because that's very out of fashion right now, but Martin Van Buren's messy side face hair, it was an embarrassment, okay? I'm just going to say it. It was Whoa. an embarrassment. Ooh. Whereas Chester Allen Arthur had very, very finely groomed uh, sideburns that went down to his mustache. I mean, the man had style. And I'm gonna, gonna have to. I'm gonna have to Google that. some pics. I'm gonna have to. Yeah, I'm gonna have to Google some pics of this. Get some fashion advice. Yeah, I. I think you could. You know, you'd have to grow out a little more on top, Ainsley. But I think you could pull off the Chester <laughs> Allen Arthur look. Okay. You, okay. You need the the really big heavy wool coat with the fur lapels, because okay. uh, Chester Allen Arthur was a bit of a dandy. Okay, okay, I could, I could do that, I could do that. He was that. definitely a style icon of his day. You know, silk top hat, uh, beaver collared, double-breasted wool coat. He was famous. He was a pimp. He was. I'll tell you what, you know, as, as stylish and as cool looking as those things were, neither one of them sound very practical. Well, I mean, it's not practical if you're in a modern building with heat. Well, no, it's a silk, a silk hat. You go outside and you sweat or it gets wet and your, your whole birthday's ruined. I think yeah. that's kind of the point, though, isn't it? To like be like, oh. I'm so fancy that I'm wearing this thing that you would think nobody could pull off, and I'm pulling it off. A beaver, pelt, a beaver pelt lapel? Get out of here with that. No, seriously. You don't, you don't need to walk around wearing that. that that's, that's too much. Would be Nobody's waterproof. neck is that cold. Yeah, well... <laughs> Maybe Chester Allen Arthur's neck was that cold. We don't know. That information has been lost to history. We'll see about that. Well, this seems like a good opportunity for us to take a break and hear from our wonderful sponsors at Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff. We'll be back with more Chapeau Chat right after this. <laughs> This is an actor portrayal. Hi, I'm Amanda, the brains and brawn behind Pig and a Pug, where I use only the best materials to give you the best products possible. For those that don't know, I'm based in the beautiful mountains of Montana, and right now it's very cold outside, 
so this is the perfect opportunity to give you guys a little bit of a news update. I just wanted to take a quick second to announce the upcoming release of our Christmas themed soaps that will be shipping the first week of December. These will make fantastic gifts for those you love. With six different custom tailored scents, there will be something for everyone. Know any Harry Potter fans? We have a selection of soaps for both kids and adults that will be shipping this coming week. We are also planning some Harry Potter related giveaways for the launch so make sure you get involved. We also have a variety of 8-ounce scented candles, sugar scrubs, and bath bombs. If this sounds up your or someone you know's alley, look us up on Facebook and on Etsy. Just search Pig and a Pug. Did you get that? Pig and a Pug. Also, as a special thank you for your support, we are offering all listeners of the Three Links Oddcast a special coupon code for 24% off your order. Just use the code THANKYOU24 at checkout. And I'll say it again, pig and a pug. All right, uh, thank you for that wonderful message from Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff. And we're back here on the Three Links Oddcast so with myself, Toby Hansen, Ainsley Heilig, our special guest host for this episode, Christopher McHale. And uh, Christopher's got a presentation for us here on one of the more obscure vice presidents of the 19th century, brother Thomas Hendricks. This should be good since he's so obscure. You guys can't fact check my stuff. Uh, so obviously, Thomas Hendricks was the old brother, uh, older brother to uh, James Hendricks, uh, guitar legend. Yes. Uh, yep. That that's a fact. So don't bother looking that up. <laughs> <laughs> he was elected vice president in 1884 under Grover Cleveland. You know, we, we don't actually know what lodge he belonged to in Indiana, so we, we can't attest to how uh, active or inactive he was. Uh, so we're off to a great start with this one. <laughs> uh, he had actually run for vice president in 1876 with Samuel Tilden, but lost. I think you are thinking of the Compromise of 1877. Oh, yeah, that's we what it is. We just talked about yeah. that before the break, where Rutherford Hayes got the presidency and uh, the Tilden and Hendricks ticket was sort of left out to dry, even though they had won the popular vote. That's correct. I, I, I'm sorry. I think I, Chris uh, did all his research on uh, his, uh, his younger brother and <laughs> that's what the error happened. So James, yeah, Hendrick, that's, yeah, that's the thing. I, yes. I totally screwed it up. Yeah. Well, uh, James, to be fair, James Hendricks uh, was a blues guitar legend, uh, also known for playing rock and or roll. Uh, Left-handed. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's what it was actually called back then. It wasn't called rock and roll until after Jimi Hendrix. Correct. So that's another fact that you guys don't need to fact check. <laughs> and also, so this is an interesting fact. Uh, did you know that in the latter half of the 19th century, Indiana was considered one of the key states in the uh, presidential elections because I didn't no know that. yeah, yeah. N seriously no president won the election without getting indiana interesting How about that? yeah yeah and we thought indiana was always obscure and mostly useless but not true hey no <laughs> no there, there's plenty of great stuff in indiana isn't a uh, three links tattoo in indiana Yes, uh, Brother Ross Carter's shop, Three Links Tattoo, is in Bloomington, Indiana. Hey, look at that. That's, uh, that, that's a, a quick free shout-out right there. So, uh, free right? shout-out to one of yeah. my tattoo brothers. There you go. There you go. So, yeah, uh, actually several vice presidential candidates from Indiana ran between 1872 and 1920. Uh, so it was a, a really political, influential state there. So having someone in an Oddfellows Lodge in Indiana around that time certainly would have been useful. Yeah, one, one other thing. I mean, there's not a whole lot that's interesting about Thomas Hendricks outside of the state of Indiana. He, I think he was governor, may have done a few other things before he served as vice president. He died in office in 1885 and really 
did not do all that much. In the 19th century, vice presidents really didn't do anything. In fact, uh, even in, into the 20th century, it was uncommon for vice presidents to be well informed about the functioning of the executive branch of government. Uh, I think John Nance Garner, who was vice president under Franklin D. Roosevelt, said that uh, it wasn't worth a bucket of warm piss to be vice president. Mm. So Hendricks was a kind of a, a minor footnote, but you know what? He was an odd fellow, so we're going to claim him. Every little bit helps. Yep. <laughs> we need all the help we could get. You know, how that, much is a bucket of warm piss worth, though? Now that I'm, I'm, I can't get that out of my head now. Well, I, I think on today's market, it's about 20 bucks, depending on the size of the bucket. But, hey, I don't judge. So I mean, you know, there's a you lot want. of uses. Buckets are cheap, too. So yeah. piss is, is going up. It okay, is. Okay, good. I'm, I'm glad I've been for, saving it all these years. You can use it for <laughs> leather tanning. You know, there's a weird group of people who are really into using it for cosmetic uses. I yeah, mean, they're there's... called people. Get it? Yeah. <laughs> There's like a my strange addiction about it. Not, not really a good one to watch. Oh, well, I man. think the next are any of them. The, <laughs> I think the yes next and no. major <laughs> odd fellow to talk about would be William McKinley. So as I mentioned earlier, President Hayes signed his application to join the Odd Fellows. Uh, McKinley was elected in 1896 and uh, assassinated in 1901 by Leon Cholgosh in Buffalo, New York, at the Pan American Exposition. One of the repeated failed presidential candidates of the Democrats during this time was another odd fellow, William Jennings Bryan, uh, who never did get elected president despite running several times. Uh, he did eventually make it as, I think, Secretary of State for someone. But uh, McKinley was a very popular president. Uh, he did a lot of westward expansion. He was really big on promoting American industry. Uh, we don't know what lodge he belonged to in Ohio. And as a side note, here's a little rant. I wish that we, as an overall organization, had better stewardship of our own history. Because it's helpful to be able to say, hey, there were these verifiable sources that tell us who were famous odd fellows. You know, we basically just repeat the same information that's copied off another website. And so it can be difficult to have an authoritative view of whether or not a certain person was a member or not. And this is kind of the case with McKinley. It's well documented that he was an odd fellow, but we have not found any documentation of which lodge he belonged to. Uh, he fought and won the Spanish-American War. He gained Cuba's independence. He got some extra territories from Spain, like Puerto Rico and Guam. And he also annexed the Hawaiian Islands. And he was not happy about the annexation and how it happened. He had an investigation of how things happened and later found out that it was actually corporate interests who ginned up the whole thing to prompt the annexation of the Hawaiian Islands and the overthrow of the actual Hawaiian royal family. So uh, he was one of the few presidents ever to actually apologize for something that he felt was done improperly. So that's uh, a little bit about William McKinley. And the big trivia piece about him is that uh, Rutherford Hayes signed his application. That's a good tidbit. Yeah, it is. So what about Warren Harding, another of our illustrious odd fellow presidents? Everybody knows that he was the 29th president, right? Of course. Mm -hmm. Between 1921 and 1923. He was born and raised on the mean streets of Bloomington Grove, Ohio. You best lock your bike there, I heard. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the thing I go to with him is the Teapot Dome scandal, which we talked a little bit about this before the show. Um, but basically the meat and potatoes of it was he was uh, basically posthumously found to have uh, had a hand in leasing Navy petroleum reserves without listening to other bids, basically sending the bids for the jobs out the back door. Uh, hard to believe that anybody would ever do that, especially a politician. And uh, a president of the never. United States, no less. 
And uh, so do you know the amount of money that was suggested uh, was retained for those services to the guy who was actually found guilty of it? No. $400,000. Really? Wow. Yep, $400,000. And that was in uh, 1929. uh, The guy was found guilty of it. And we get an amazing little piece of... uh, uh, why, Why am I... We get a, a great, co- is it a colloquialism? Yeah, you could call it that. Uh, we get a yeah. new phrase. Uh, the term fall guy, because the guy that uh, ac- actually went down for the whole thing, his surname was Fall. Yes, Albert Fall. I think he was uh, interior secretary. Oh, yes. interesting. That is a great little nugget. So I just Googled very quickly. Um, so our listeners will have to do the math because I am not a mathematician. Mm-hmm. But the inflation rate or the adjusted you know, inflation for uh, $1929 to $2020, $100 in 1929 is the equivalent of $1,522.11 today. Wow. So four hundred thousand dollars would be a holy heck of a lot. That's yeah. like four hundred eleven million six hundred thousand dollars, roughly. Quadrillions. Yeah, that's that's several hundred million dollars. You could build half of an NFL stadium for that kind of money. There you go. Yeah, Dream, the drinks about- are on him over at the saloon. Yeah, the other thing about <laughs> Warren Harding is he died in office. He was on a tour of the West Coast. Uh, he got to San Francisco, and he died there. That's when Calvin Coolidge took over as president. And Calvin Coolidge had such a low political profile that after he took over as president, nobody knew who he was, and the Secret Service wasn't even aware that he was the vice president. He had to be sworn in as president at uh, a little chapel in Vermont because he had been home visiting his parents at the time that President Harding passed away. Hmm. Well, they did call him Silent Cal. So. Yes, they did. It's he a real secret profile. service. Yeah. Well, that should bring us up to uh, another of our odd fellow presidents. And he actually, like Grant, got to serve with an odd fellow vice president. That would be Brothers Franklin Roosevelt and John Nance Garner. And don't forget that his lovely wife, Eleanor, was a Rebecca. That's correct. As best as I could find out, he was an odd fellow in Grand Junction, Colorado, because I I, I guess that's where uh, his wife was a Rebecca. Am I correct in thinking that? He may have had an associate membership in Grand Junction. Uh, his home lodge was Hyde Park number 206 in New York. Okay, so it wasn't Hyde Park. Um, his house there, I know, is a, a national monument. Uh, he was uh, well known for his work with the March of Dimes, uh, mm. which is actually why his face is on the dime at the moment. Uh, he was on more, uh, he was on a, a lot of uh, U.S. postage stamps. Uh, let's see. He is one of a few politician or American presidents that have statues of themselves outside of the United States. Uh, there is a statue of FDR in Mayfair, London. Not surprising. Uh, also, uh, so Roosevelt did a lot of things while he was in office and it was kind of hard to narrow it down to just, you know, one or two things. One of the things that really took me back that I didn't actually know about uh, was that in 1938, he put into action expedited immigration policies for German and Austrian citizens to escape uh, persecution in Europe. Well, that's interesting. That was was interesting. I didn't didn't know about that. It's, uh, oh, I misspoke earlier. It was Hyde Park number 203 in New York. I don't want to get an angry letter from the Grand Lodge of New York for making that mistake. (laughs) You got now, a problem. There goes all those listeners from I New know. York that all, we gained. You know, we so many listeners on Long Island that we picked up after we had Brother Mike on here, the Grand Master of New York. They're all gone the now because I messed flipping up. Flipping tables. Sorry, sorry, New York. Yeah, that's they Hyde switched Park over to modern goat rider. Oh no! <laughs> oh. And by the way, for the finest in Odd Fellow podcasting, be sure and check out Modern Goat Rider. Josh and Billy do such a great job there. 
obviously FDR is a super incredibly well-known, probably one of our most well-known presidents, you know, Lincoln, Washington, Roosevelt, Kennedy, maybe. Uh, those are the ones that even people who don't really know anything about American history seem to know something about. But uh, Roosevelt had a vice president who was an odd fellow for his first two terms. And what can you tell us about John Nance Garner? The, the famous Texas lawyer, Mr. Garner, his, his nickname, Cactus Jack. Cactus uh, Jack. He, uh, his, his claim to fame, or what I'm saying should be his claim to fame, uh, was he was the one that selected the state flower of Texas, the prickly pear cactus. So that yes. is where his nickname comes from. And a, uh, a random tidbit of knowledge, uh, he died 15 days short of his 100th birthday. Yes, he did. And I, I should mention, um, there was a, quite a contentious battle in Texas over the state flower, whether it should be the prickly pear cactus or the blue bonnet. And uh, Cactus Jack, he lost that fight because uh, as any one of our Texas listeners will tell us, their state flower is the blue bonnet now. So he tried valiantly uh, to succeed and make the prickly pear cactus the state flower, but he lost. Now, one other interesting piece of trivia about John Nance Garner is that he is one of only two vice presidents to have also served as Speaker of the House of Representatives. But we've actually talked about the other one on this episode. Who knows who it is? Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> that would you be are, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Skyler close. Colfax. <laughs> yes, I'm Skyler sitting in the back of the classroom, if you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I am not surprised, brother. I actually knew that. <laughs> yeah, Colfax and Garner both served as Speaker of the House and Vice President. Now, Gerald Ford actually uh, sort of qualifies for that, although Ford was never elected Vice President. Uh, he was also not Speaker of the House. He was actually Minority Leader in the House because he was a Republican from Michigan uh, at the time when the Democrats controlled the House of Representatives. So a little bit of uh, history there that uh, both vice presidents who are also speakers of the house were odd fellows. Nice. And now I think it's time for us to give our shout out. Uh, our regular listeners know that we like to highlight lodges out there across the globe that are doing great work for odd fellowship. And for this episode, we are going to spotlight a lodge in my home jurisdiction of Washington. Yay. Hey, Washougal Lodge number 194. It's down on the Columbia River, uh, about 20, 25 miles maybe east of Portland, but on the Washington side of the river. They have a fantastic and dedicated group of members down there. And I must say, of all of the visits I did as Grand Master, they put on an amazing spread. They had a full ham dinner for me, which I really, really appreciated. Because I am a past grandmaster who loves a good ham. So this lodge, uh, they do a lot of great charitable work in the community. Every year they raise money and award four $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. Oh, wow. They also raise money annually for their town's Christmas decorations so they can put up all the, the lights and evergreen boughs on the, the street lights there in downtown Washougal. But the, the thing that I, I like most about this lodge and I think is most commendable is they are a major supporter of the Holly House Domestic Violence Shelter and have been since 2006. This year, they raised several hundred dollars towards cleaning supplies and hygiene kits for the shelter guests. And they also have an ongoing project where they collect clothing, towels, bedding, and uh, children's activities that they can distribute at the shelter, uh, which I think is just such an incredibly wonderful thing to do, especially because they're in a much more rural part of the state of Washington. In the city, there are a lot of resources for someone who's in need. In a rural area, it's a lot more limited, and that lodge just goes above and beyond 
uh, to make sure that Holly House has what they need to be able to support people who are in crisis in their community. So props to Washougal number 194. Now, yeah, well if you've done, got a suggestion for a lodge, you would like to get a shout out. Ainsley, how can they get a hold of us? They can reach us a number of ways. They could either email us at three links oddcast at gmail.com. And that that's is the number three. The number three <clears throat> links oddcast at gmail.com. They could contact us on our Facebook page or on our Instagram or on the website, which is three links oddcast.com, spelled out three T H R E E links oddcast.com wonderful and we we love getting your suggestions uh we've already got a list of a couple lodges coming up that are going to get featured on the shout out so make sure you keep those coming in because every time we do a new episode we like to highlight the great stuff that's happening out there in the world of odd fellowship well brothers before we move on and uh do our closing segment the odd podge do you have any uh, kind of reaction to all of this information we've tossed around about these great odd fellow presidents and vice presidents and one Canadian prime minister? I have learned a lot about impressive facial hair and chapeaus. Mm -hmm. That's precisely what we wanted you to take out of this. So yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> one thing that I would say about it is Odd fellowship is not necessarily about being impressive and, you know, showing off how many famous and talented people that we have. I mean, let the other guys have Mozart and Gene Autry and John Philip Sousa and George Washington. We are completely content with Rutherford B. Hayes because he, we know that he was a good man uh, and a good humanitarian. We I think are kind of founded as underdogs. And today we continue as underdogs, so it fits that our famous, notable odd fellows are also somewhat in their own ways underdogs. And they might not have been the most famous or the most noteworthy or the most respectable, or maybe they got a little famous, but then they had a little bit of a snafu along the way and they kind of lost their shimmer. But they did a lot of good stuff. And they weren't perfect, but nobody's perfect. And that's okay, but they did a lot of good stuff. And that's what we're trying to do, is try to be better people. And we're not going to be perfect. So, yeah, we're just odd. I, I tell you what, an honor, a couple honorable mentions, though. Yeah. Winston Churchill. I mean, he, you, you, oh, you yeah. can't complain about having him on the roster. That's true. Uh, I've I've heard he was kind of an important figure in the 20th century. I I think more than a couple of people have heard of him, so that's a step in the right direction. And he uh, definitely worked very closely with uh, FDR, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I know they were also they were both Masons, I believe. Yeah, I, I know, I know, uh, definitely FDR was. I believe Churchill was right. So they were intrafraternal as well. And uh, how about Charlie Chaplin? Now, that's, that's another thing. We've actually had uh, some other famous people, Charlie Chaplin, Wyatt Earp, Charles Lindbergh, Burl Ives. One of my personal favorites is Charles Russell, the famous Western landscape painter. And, uh, of course, he's from your jurisdiction, Chris. He's there in Montana. He belonged to Rainbow 28 in Great Falls. And uh, when I was there for your Montana sessions a couple years ago, I found out how he got kicked out of the lodge. It oh? was for public drunkenness. Uh, gotta, gotta bless him. Yeah. It seems you know, like that's what they were all thrown out for. That, that, that was one of the things that particularly interested me for a while, too, was finding out what was getting Oddfellows thrown out of lodges because the Grand Secretary used to send out these like little flyers saying like do not allow this person in they were uh, uh removed from the organization and a lot of times it was for either drunkenness or behavior unbecoming of an odd fellow i love how an organization that started as a drinking club and in bars got so entrenched with the temperance movement and to be respectable and all that that 
you know, that you couldn't be a saloon keeper or a barkeep and be a member and alcohol was forbidden from the lodge and only water could be drunk in the lodge and that public drunkenness would get you barred from the lodge. It, it's very interesting how things could radically flip flop. And now we're kind of back to incorporating conviviality as not during lodge itself, but outside of lodge, but many lodges ho- housing bars that yeah. are private for the members. So it's kind of an interesting seeing how things have come and gone in for uh, as far as conviviality. Well, there's a good contrast there between two presidents of the 19th century. On the one hand, you have Mr. $20 Bill, Andrew Jackson, a Freemason who used to hold drunken free-for-alls in the White House. In one case, I think the party got so out of hand that uh, party guests started smashing White House China. Then on the other hand, you have sainted brother Rutherford Burchard Hayes of the Independent Order of Oddfellows and his wife, Lemonade Lucy Hayes, who was the one who banned alcohol in the White House and ensured that everything remained very prim and proper and sober at the White House. And it remained so until uh, the untimely assassination of President James A. Garfield, uh, because his vice president, Chester Allen Arthur, he of the impressive uh, sideburns, he took over and was quite the party boy from New York City and brought the liquor back to the White House after Lemonade Lucy. You know, I'm actually taking a minute now to quickly Google these these sideburns because before i was i was interested and now since it's come up so many times i feel like i'm i'm on the edge of my seat i need to know what these look like (laughs) brother i i can tell you on the honor of the independent order of odd fellows the man had bitchin facial hair he did wow chester allen arthur had it going on i I feel like i feel like i need to take a moment here and look too yeah, I, I, I tell you what, it's a statement, if nothing else. It is. You know, like you're walking down the street like this and you're Ooh. going, I want to look like this. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, the beaver collar on the coat and everything. The man had it going on. Oh, yes. Oh. Oh, look at him. And a monocle. Oh, yeah. Chester oh. Allen Arthur, he, he was the man. In, he also in, had a, he had to have had a cane with a dagger inside of it too. I believe he did. I well, bet he used words like dastardly. And coming to power after the assassination of James A. Garfield, you know, how, how could you not have a cane with a dagger in it? I mean, yeah. what if another presidential assassin comes up and tries to kill you? What are you going to do? Well, that's when you need your dagger cane. I mean, that look at those. Yeah. Look at those. Uh, I mean, do you call those cheek curtains? I I don't know. Oh, cheek those are just, curtains. I've never heard that one before. Cheek curtains. Those they're are not just much amazing chops. sideburns. They're they're absolutely incredible. They cascade like two waterfalls of silver. Yeah, from his cheeks off his face jowl. curtains. Yes. like they're just like jowl <laughs> Niagara Falls. Yeah. Jowl Niagara Falls. But your your beard is too thick to look like that though yours would look better his are all stringy yeah his are translucent and yeah yeah, i I would get a good solid a good solid um yeah yeah you you better do this now yes so i just gotta gotta shave the middle yeah yeah okay yeah yeah ainsley there's your halloween costume next year Uh, I, i i totally got it yeah People are, yeah. I wonder what people are going to think that, like, you escaped from a psych ward or something. I mean, look at this guy. <laughs> not crazy. Like, can't like you tell this is, a beaver, this is a beaver pelt collar? <laughs> I'm wearing a, a, a silk hat. Sir, it's raining out. It's a silk hat. <laughs> it's like it melted. It's yeah, like well, that's what I picture. I picture like a, a pair of old women's underwear on your head. <laughs> Bloomers. Yeah. Well, Chester Allen Arthur was quite the man about town. I mean, anything is possible. (laughs) We should probably wrap this episode up here with our final feature, The Odd Pods, where each of us gets to uh, do a little bit of self-promotion. We can share whatever we want. You want to go first, Ainsley? 
I would love to. Um, can I throw in a bonus odd podge on behalf of Sergio, who is not here this evening? Yes, please do. I am so proud to announce that Sergio has had his first submission published on the Heart and Hand blog that I um, co-run with uh, brother Scott Moy. And it is on why he became an Odd Fellow. It is out now. If you go to oddfellowsguide.com, it is currently the um, first thing that you hit. Um, it's the most recent published article. So Sergio has had his maiden voyage of uh, written publication. So if anybody wants to go check out the written word and see his beautiful face right up front there, uh, just go to oddfellowsguide.com. I was going to say, for those who don't know, how does one go about submitting something for the Heart and Hand blog? There are a number of ways. Um, you could either send it to me um, personally. Uh, people send them through Facebook to me or whatever or to the Facebook page for um, Heart and Hand, or you could send us an email to um, oddfellowsguide at gmail.com, or you could just, there, we got a submission page on um, oddfellowsguide.com. There's a submission page. Has anyone ever made a submission via Telegram? Oh, that sounds fantastic, and no. Just have like a random cheated. person dressed as a clown show up at the tattoo shop? <laughs> I am very glad that we are by appointment only with the door locked at all times right now. Okay. Because I'm terrified. That makes me think somewhere, somewhere out there, there has to be a hipster who's sitting there going, oh, I should start using the telegraph again. That'll be super old school. Because, <laughs> you know, if you check the back of your dues card, the odd fellow's telegraph code is still there. You can yep. actually use it. You know, if you want to send a special secret coded message to a lodge across the country, you can send it by telegraph using that secret code, and the lodge at the other end will know exactly what you mean. People are always I... so tickled when I show the back of my encampment card to show that it does have the cipher key on the back with the words, and they're like, are you serious? I'm like, no, let me show you, and I whip it on my wallet, and they're like, what the hell kind of club is this? <laughs> and I'm like, it's the best! <laughs> only the finest obscure secrets for us like vice finest. president thomas hendrix for example <laughs> <laughs> so that, what's your other that, odd podge yes yeah, so then i will move on to my own odd podge so last time i was on this program i humble bragged about my appearance on or not my appearance yeah it's still upcoming as of right now but the recording of my appearance for the uh ghost brothers show where i appear as the Odd Fellows expert. Well, um, since then, I have had a, um, another couple opportunities come forth. And um, this one I will mention is already available for you to Google on the um, pretty well known uh, website, uh, mentalfloss.com. I was interviewed on behalf of the Sovereign Grand Lodge. Terry kicked it over to me because Terry does not like doing media stuff. So it, the article is called The Secret Society That Left a Trail of Human Skeletons in Its Wake. That is a mouthful. Mm. However, it was an article about the many articles of, uh, if you Google Odd Fellows, a lot of the first things you find are these articles about skeletons being found in old lodge halls. What the hell is up with that? So this article addresses that. And so I'm not going to get into that because I'm going to want y'all to Google it. Um, it's on metalfloss.com. Uh, just Google metal floss in my name and it'll come up immediately. Ainsley Heilick, metal floss. Boom. It's a secret society that left a trail of human skeletons in its wake. If you want to learn about the actual history of our skeletons and not the legends of you know we dug it up and all that kind of nonsense which is or it was an old brother that donated his body you know all that good stuff this is the factual boom so yes that's my humble brag odd podge it's a hell of a headline yeah, that yeah. is an excellent headline it definitely gets me to click i think <laughs> that's called click bait in fact yeah and actually above it is like a little it's hard to show you on the thing is it says weird in a little green little point down box. Mm. So, so we weird. know it is weird. Yeah. 
All right, Christopher, what do you got to share with us? Okay. So we're going to, since this is an odd podcast, I'm going to go with a bit of an odd shout out here. Okay. Uh, basically a, uh, an, an organization that doesn't get any publicity at all. And these are the Castum people in the village of Tana on the island of Vanuatu. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, you, I'm assuming that you guys, I mean, you, you guys seem on board. Like you already know where this is going. I'm familiar I with I am Vanuatu. a history degree holder, so I know very well of the art that comes from that island, actually. So. Well, this, Not- this is a little bit different. This is an art, oh. but yes. Uh, so Prince Philip uh, visited this island in the 1950s. And uh, then the queen herself visited the island in 1974. Oh, lovely. And ever since these, the, the Castum tribe, have, uh, they received some good luck afterwards. So ever since, they have looked at Prince Philip as uh, like a, a deity, a god, and they worship him and they have pictures of him all over the place. Uh, it's kind of uh, a, a random... Uh, story that just makes you scratch your head and i thought that maybe it would be something that someone might go well what's all that about and might want to look it up and look into this weird thing but it's true and they love prince philip just as much as i do so is it kind of like a like a chance thing that like he visited and then they had like a couple really just yep. great years afterwards and pretty much like, yeah and they um, owe it all to him, and it yeah, just has become I mean, correlation this crazy. Is causation? Yeah, that yeah, works for me. I'm all for it. You got to believe oh. in something, and believing in Prince Philip is, you know, it's all right. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Well, here's my odd podge. Um, might have mentioned a while back that I was going to be doing uh, an interview and a guest appearance on the Masonic Light podcast. We've been talking a lot on this episode about odd fellows who were presidents, vice presidents, and one prime minister of Canada. And uh, of course, the secret society that's had the most U.S. presidents are the Masons. And so I had the good fortune to sit down a couple of weeks ago uh, with the hosts of the Masonic Light podcast and uh, spend a good deal of time talking about odd fellowship and uh, what makes us special and unique as compared to Masons and why we would love to have all of those wonderful Masons come and be odd fellows as well. So that is, I believe, uh, if I remember right, the episode is scheduled to be released uh, coming up on Monday the 16th of November. So uh, this episode should be out by then. So if you want to hear an odd fellows perspective on a Masonic podcast, go over and check out our friends at the Masonic Light podcast, and you can hear me drone on and on and on about the wonders of Odd Fellowship. I believe I did the Masonic Light podcast uh, a year or so ago. Yeah, I think you did. And uh, yeah. I, I think it's fair to say that uh, their excellent work in podcasting uh, has been a big inspiration, at least for us, uh, and maybe for some of the other Odd Fellows podcasters as well, because all of us who've started doing this whole podcast thing, we all kind of said, hey, where's the podcast for Odd Fellows? And uh, we just picked up and started doing it ourselves. One of those wonderful COVID things that came to fruition after discussing it for several years. That's right. And then two of them came up and I, you know, we're glad to have Modern Goat Rider as our um, cohort. And uh, is it next week that we are doing the joint episode i'm glad you mentioned that because if all works out schedule wise uh next week we should be recording a joint two-part episode a crossover between modern goat rider and the three links <laughs> oddcast we get all the greatest minds in odd fellows new media together and we're going to do a big two-part episode so here's it's gonna how be it's like gonna captain work. planet <laughs> You're going to have to get one half of the episode from Modern Goat Rider and one half of the episode from us. This ensures that all 19 of our Canadian listeners will be subscribed to Modern Goat Rider, which they really should be already. Come on, Nova Scotia, get it together. And then uh, 
everybody that we have who are subscribers down in Texas will get the opportunity to subscribe to Modern Goat Rider. So great cross promotion and could not happen with a better group of odd fellows. You know, Josh and Billy do such a wonderful job on that podcast. I listen to every episode as soon as it comes out because they are a real treasure of odd fellowship. Hey, can I actually throw in one last final Hail Mary here for a uh, a notable odd fellow? Yeah. P.T. Barnum. That's right. Brother Mm. Barnum, the greatest show on earth. Imagine having him around. Didn't he say that he didn't need the odd fellows, but the odd fellows needed him? You know, that may be true. I am. It sounds like something he would say. Yeah, Yeah, that's. It sounds credible. Do you think it was true? You I know, would believe it. It sounds like him. I, I, I wouldn't doubt that. Uh, not that I wouldn't also want to see a source for that, but I also wouldn't doubt it necessarily. But the, um, the Kentucky Giant, one of his sideshow performers, was also an odd fellow, and he was, I believe, the one who got P.T. Barnum involved in it because... I don't know if P.T. Barnum was very involved. I think he might have maybe just, you know, signed up and went through the degrees and was like, okay, I did this thing. You know, I haven't been able to really find anything in my little bit of research I have done on P.T. Barnum as an odd fellow. I don't know if anybody else out there has anything good on it. I would love to know more about if there's anybody has a little treasure trove somewhere of that history. That would be awesome because we have a lot of holes in our history that we need filled. Yes. So, so well, if anybody wants to go on a treasure hunt, there's a good one. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Brother Christopher. It has been wonderful having you along for this episode. It's great to have you off the bench to come in and pinch it when we've got one of our regulars out. Of course. Uh, you guys need me more than I need you. <laughs> I don't know. You you seem to be a pretty popular guy there in Missoula being a soccer coach now and all. Oh, I don't know about all that, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, take care, brothers, and thank you very much for listening, everyone. Uh, we hope to uh, have you listening again very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>